So this is what Intel added for the 286. This part of the processor that maps addresses to provide virtual memory. And if you have a modern x86 processor, it can still mimic those pre-1982 ones that didn't have memory protection. So you can run it in any mode. If you run it in real mode, programs have direct access to the whole memory space. They're not going through any of that address mapping process. But the normal mode of operation is in protected mode where you are going through that memory mapping. That means you've got some state of the processor that only the kernel can modify. It includes the flags, right? So these are things that control what level the running program has. So if another program could change that, that would be bad. It also includes these control registers that can do things that control the memory map. And the main one we're going to talk about today is what's in CR3 that can control the base of the page table. Now we're going to look at all the steps where you go from a logical address that's used in a program to the physical address that's used to access the actual physical memory. And it's a pretty long process to get there. So this is what the logical address looks like. We have a 16-bit segment se selector, and we have 64 bits of offset. So this is giving us a flat 64-bit address space. We've got 2 to the 64 different addresses we can do. There's actually some restriction on that, so you can't actually access all of them. And we're going to turn that into some linear address. We're going to select the segment, and then we've got a logical address that has the segment and the offset. In it. If we fetch an instruction, so we've got an instruction pointer that gives us the location we want. The instructions are coming from the code segment. So there's a register that points to the code segment. What's in that register, we have the table index. We have one bit that tells us if it's in the global or the local table. And then we have two bits that give us the ring we're running. Remember, we have four levels of rings in the x86. So we have 13 bits left to index into that table. These segment registers, right? so this is one of several segment registers, those are protected. So only the kernel can write into the segment registers that control the value of the ring as well as the table index. What's in those tables? So there are two. There's a local one and a global one. The global one's shared by all processes. The local one, each process has its own. Other than that, they're, they're the same idea. So we've got a table. It's got 13 bits to index. So we've got 8,192 entries. And so we can find an entry in that table, and it's going to point to some segment in memory. Those segments can overlap. It's just a way of going from an address with a base address to an address in that linear space. We've got these two tables, one per process and one global. How do you decide where that table, how do you find that table? So this is a big data structure. It's not some special thing in hardware like a register. It's stored in regular memory. How does the processor find it? Is this one of those magical things that we're not supposed to understand like quantum physics? OK, yeah, so maybe th that could work, at least for the global table, to have it at some fixed location in memory. That's not actually how it's done. That couldn't work for the local one, because we need one for each process. So there can't be just one fixed location where it always is. Good, so there's some pointer that tells you where it is. There's some value re you read. Where should that value be stored? What's the important thing about how you store that value? So who should be able to write to that value? Yeah, this, this is a good answer. This answer has worked for about half the questions I asked today. So it's, it's, if, if you're not sure, it's a good thing to go with, right? So if this location is storing where this table is, it's really important that a user process can't change it. So it has to be stored somewhere only the kernel can write to. And in fact, we have special registers for that. There are two special registers that are for storing the address in memory where those tables are stored. And those also need to be on pages in memory that only the kernel can write to. If you remember last class, well, we looked at the list of privileged instructions on x86, and those are the first two. The first two on that list are instructions for loading values into those two special registers. We're making progress in our mapping. We've taken our logical address and turned it into a linear address space with two to the 64 addresses. Should we have enough memory to store all, all two to, uh, to have values at all two to the 64 addresses? If each one was a byte, can we have two to the 64 values of memory? Two, uh, two to the 64 bytes of RAM? How much do you think that would cost? Way too much. So do you think Google could afford it? What about Apple? 
Apple could just about afford it, but not Google. So it would cost, it costs about $10 per gigabyte, at least on the retail market. Probably if you're Apple or Google, you can buy your RAM for less than that. So we're talking about $172 billion, which if you're Apple, that's what you make in a year. So you could probably afford it. The only people that can realistically think about having that amount of memory are the NSA. So if you're the federal government, that's about 18 days of spending. So if you can think of something really useful to do with two of the 64 bytes of memory, you can probably get it in your budget if you're the NSA. Maybe not. Maybe even that's real money for them. But they're getting, getting towards things that are not that far from that. You can't afford to have enough memory for all that. But we need to provide that address space to programs. So how do we do it? If you aren't as rich as Apple to be able to afford that much RAM, where do you store things? Yeah, you store them in a medium that's much less expensive. You store them on a disk. And storing memory on a disk is far less expensive than storing in RAM. We still probably don't need two to the 64 bytes of memory, but it's okay, right? So we can store all the parts of memory that we're not using often on a disk. What that means is we need some way of getting the things that we're actually using into physical memory when we need them. So that's what the paging unit is doing. We have a way of mapping the pages in memory. They're either stored in physical memory or they're stored on the disk. So this is how that works. We've got a table in memory. We want to have a way of mapping to, regular me to physical memory some logical address. If it's in physical memory, it should be there. If it's not, it's on the disk and we need to get it from the disk. So we have a table of pages. Each entry in the table is either a pointer to a location in physical memory or it keeps track of a page not being there. So we have one bit as part of that entry that indicates when a page is not actually in physical memory. That means it's swapped to the disk and if we're reading or writing to that page, we need to read that page from the disk and put in the physical memory to use it. So let's check that we understand everything we're doing so far. So how many pages in memory do we need to store the page table? Okay, so how do we figure out how many pages we need? So how many entries are there in the page table? So there, there are two ways to answer this question. One is to work out the math and figure out what you get and hope it makes sense. The other way is to think about what you want the answer to this to be and guess and hope you get lucky. So what do you want the answer to this question to be if you don't want to work out the math? How many pages should it take to store the page table? And the answer is not. Only the kernel can write to this, even though that's a good answer for most questions. So any question in computer science that's about a number, what are the acceptable answers? Yeah, so it's either 0, 1, or many. Those are the only acceptable numbers for a computer scientist. Which one of those do we think it is? So we can eliminate 0. If it was 0, we would have no page table. If it was many, what would we have to do? Would, would this design need to be more complicated if it was many? How would the page directory need to change if the page table was more than one page? So you'd need another indirection, at least. you need some way, instead of just pointing to an index in the page table, you need something here to point to which page and then an index on that page. And then, well, what if that page wasn't in memory? You've got other things to worry about. So if you had some arbitrary number of pages, you would have a problem. So you really want the answer to be one. This design would be an awful lot simpler if we only need one page to store the page table. And all of the numbers for these things here all of these other decisions should have been made with the goal of making the page table fit on one page. Hopefully they were right. We should check this. I guess people have been using x86s for a while, so if they got it wrong, we pro probably would have noticed by now. But let's check and make sure it's right. How many entries are there in the page table? Right, remember, the address has 10 bits for the page. So how many entries are in the page table? Yeah, 2 to the 10. So we have 2 to the 10 pages. We've decided that in our address. How big is each page table entry? So each entry has a 20-bit address, which we're using to figure out the offset, and 12 bits of flags, which are keeping track of properties of that page, like whether it's present. So that's 32 bits. That's 4 bytes. Can we store 2 to the 12 bits on one page? One page has, there's a 12-bit offset to access memory on a page. So what's the page size? Yeah, the page size is 4K, so it's 2 to the 12. Each page, 4 kilobytes. That's exactly what we need to store the page table. If it was less than that, we'd be wasting 
space on that page. If it was more than that, we'd have a lot of complexity to deal with. So it's very intentional in the design of this that the page table fits in exactly one page. All of these decisions are pretty arbitrary. We saw Multics had 18 bits for the segment address. There's no reason that a page has to have 10 bits and the offset has to be 12. All these decisions are based on trying to get good performance and use your memory resources well. So now we've gone through all the steps. They seem pretty long and painful. How can our machines run so fast if we have to do all of this every time we access memory? Caching, yes. Yes, the answer is we don't actually have to do all of this every time. What modern processors have is a cache. So once you've done this transformation once, once you've done all these translations, you know the mapping between some logical address and its physical address. And you can store that in a cache called the TLB and not have to go through that process every time. As many steps and as painful as this looks, as long as you're accessing the same locations in memory over and over again, which is what typical programs do, it's not as expensive as it seems. So now I can show you what I think is my favorite statement in the entire Linux kernel. And I have not read all the code, so it's possible you'll find a statement that's even better than this one. But this one's pretty good. So what does this do? We're reading the value in the CR3. This is getting the value in the CR3, and we're writing to it. So this is basically assigning a value to itself. If a really smart compiler can figure that out, it should optimize out this code, right? So what do you think this is doing? Why is this instruction that looks like a new op actually doing something really important. Okay, good. You're very much on the right track. So when do we need to change that cache? That cache fills up, right? As we access memory, it's recording this mapping. When do we flush the cache? When I close a program. Um, at, when I close a program, I don't need the cache anymore. Is there some more important time when I need to deliberately erase what's in that cache? Yes. So this cache is maintained by the hardware. So we don't have any instructions even that the kernel can run to deliberately put values in that cache or, or replace them. Right? It's up to the hardware to maintain that cache. The processor, when it goes through all these translations, going through all these steps, figuring out a new mapping for an address, it's storing that in the cache. And the next time that address is requested, it's going to look up and see if it's in the cache. When does that mapping change? When do we have to not use the old mappings that might be in that cache? So remember, what was our overall goal for this part of the lecture, most of the class today? Uh-oh, do I need to go back to the beginning? Yeah, so, so what is our goal? What are we trying to provide with all, all of this mechanism? Excellent, right. So we're trying to provide memory isolation so one process can't interfere with the memory of another process. So when do we need to flush what's in that cache? Yeah, right. So if we switch processes, we better make sure that cache is empty. If that cache wasn't emptied, a program that's no longer the right process now could get a logical address and skip all of the things that are done in here. If you could skip that by going through the cache, well, then you could access physical memory of some other process. So that means it's up to the operating system to make sure that cache gets flushed when we switch processes. The way that happens is with this code. So this code is what Linux is doing to flush the TLB. What it's doing is writing to CR3, the old value that was in CR3. So it has no effect if you think of this as a normal instruction. What it does in the hardware, though, is, so let me just, before I get, so this is showing what those codes are, so you know I, I haven't left anything out, right? So these functions are just assembly code for writing into that register, reading and writing into that register. What's happening in the hardware, there's some connection between the CR3 register and the TLB that whenever the CR3 gets written to, it sends a signal to the TLB to flush the cache because that means the page directory mapping has changed. We can't use any of the old values in the TLB. The Linux kernel is doing when it creates a new process, before it switches to that new process, it's flushing the cache. What happens when there's a page fault? So now I've tried to access some location in memory. It's valid location for this process. But the entry says it's not present. So what happens when a program does that? Yes. Good. So that means that we need to go to the disk to get that page. Who is responsible for going to the disk to get the page? Where's the code that is actually doing that running? Yeah, that's going to be in the kernel. Right, so this page fault is going to generate an interrupt that 
gets the kernel to run, and the kernel's gonna figure out how to find that page. How expensive is it to have a page fault? It's pretty expensive. If you gotta read from a disk, you're already using about eight million nanoseconds. To do a page fault, well, you've also gotta do a context switch, because you're jumping into the kernel, so that means you're moving everything out of registers and copying it in memory and copying it back, and, and doing these other things like flushing the cache, which is expensive. So it's probably about, you know, at least 20 million instructions, the equivalent of running a 20 million normal instructions or so. But they still happen pretty frequently. And this is a trade-off between how much money you have for physical memory and how much memory your programs are using. If you look at programs that are executing, and you can see Chrome is using up tons and tons of memory, um, you can see page faults. I don't know if you can see them with the nice GUI activity monitor, but you can see them with top. These are pretty big numbers, so we're, we're in the you know, tens of millions of page faults for programs that have been running for, for a long time. They're not extremely rare events, they are expensive events. I will leave this, so this program's on the notes, we'll talk about this next class, you can try running it and think about what it does. I would encourage you all to look at how memory is being used by your laptop. You've been looking at how the CPU's been used already for problem set two, look at the memory as well, and Definitely get going on problem set two. You should also see a link to sign up for a problem set two demo.